Welcome to Public Domain Video Theater presented by the great detectives of old time radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Well, today we're going to bring you another episode of Dragnet. This one uh, is Season 4, Episode 12, original air date, November the 11th, 1954. And it's based on a radio play originally aired March 8th of 1951. And the title is The Big New Year. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Los Angeles, California. I work here. I'm a cop. It was December 31st, New Year's Eve. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide, special duty. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. It was New Year's Eve. All available men were ordered to be on duty. It was a big night for some of the people. Like a shooter, I'm good. Oh, boy. Joe, how's it going? Oh, hi, Jack. Pretty busy. How's it outside? Cold. Not enough to keep people at home, though. Mm-hmm. Rough night, huh? Looks like a wild one. Been keeping the complaint board busy. Seems bigger than last New Year's. You're on with Frank and me tonight, is that right? Mm-hmm. Thought he was going to have it off. Wife had a little house party planned and everything. That's too bad. Maybe next time, huh? That's what I said last New Year's. Where's Frank? Just passed him down the hall a minute ago. Said he'd be right back. Yeah. Anything in the book? Oh, I almost forgot. Lloyd Hopper called. He's having a little party out at his house. He wants us to drop around when we get off. Said he'd call us back. Hi. I just Hi. tagged by communications. The switchboard's lit up like a Christmas tree. They're sure doing a lot of business. Yeah, Joe was telling me. Just like last year, they're sure starting off strong. Yeah, 415s, 4127s. Calls coming in by the dozen. You know, I'd like to see it just once. People celebrating New Year's without tearing up half the town. I'll go. Homicide, McCready. Oh, yeah, Lloyd. Uh-huh. Joe just mentioned it. Well, we'll try and make it. You know how things are tonight. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Lloyd Hopper on his way home. As he sure hopes we can make it if we get off early. Not much chance of that. Yeah. I guess you can't tell. We might get a break. I don't know. Crowds are starting in pretty early. Good chance he'll break and go home right after midnight. That should get us off early. Yeah. That was the idea last year, wasn't it, Frank? Yeah. What time did you get off? 6 a.m. Hi, it's too bad I told you. He threw the bottle right at me. He threw it right at my face. <laughs> Sergeant Jack McCready, Frank, and I stayed on duty at the city hall. As any police officer can tell you, New Year's Eve for him is one of the hardest working nights in the year. This one was no different for us. Within an hour, we'd received more than a half a dozen calls to be checked out. Street fights, ADW calls, cuttings, the usual complaints that you'd expect to get when a community of four million celebrates New Year's Eve. 9.43 p.m. Unit 7R2 at Wilshire and Geneva. At 211. At 211. JMA 367. Roger, 7R2. Unit 1A12 at 83 Naylor Avenue. See the map. No stopping him, huh? Yeah, it's a big night. Homicide, Friday. Roger, 7R2. What's that? No. Unit 1A12. No, ma'am, no. No, you have the wrong division. If you'll wait just a second, I'll have you transferred. No, I'll have you transferred. You won't have to call back. All right, hold on, please. Hello. Could you give this call to 2511, please? Yes, that's right. Robbery. Thank you. Attention, all units. All units in the vicinity of East Main and Darwin. An officer needs help. Code 2. Sounds like somebody's got trouble, huh? Yeah. 
All units in the vicinity at East Main and Darwin. An officer needs help. Code 2. KMA 367. I feel for those guys. We were on that detail last year, you know. Yeah. Well, at least it's still code 2. You got a cigarette? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Joe? Yeah. That's a great. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Homicide, Friday. No, Mac. He's not here now. No. No, I don't have him. No, I'll have him come right over, though, as soon as he does get in. Joe? Right. Right. Just a second. Right, Mac. What? Yeah, man. You guys haven't got anything, have you? All units on frequency one, stand by. All units on frequency one, stand by. All units and 1A1, attention all units, all units, the call to East Main and Darwin is now a shooting. 1A1 handle, code three. All units and 1A1, attention all units, all units, call to Can we get through here? Three planes? Let us through, please. Right. Right. No. It's Lloyd Hopper. Man? He's dead. His full name was Lloyd Nicholas Hopper. Badge number 7501. He was one of the veteran officers in Central Homicide. He'd been shot twice at the base of his skull. There were four more bullet wounds in his back. Frank got to a phone, called Homicide, and told them what had happened. Additional cruiser cars and more from Metro Reserve were immediately dispatched to the scene of the killing. They circled the area for a dozen blocks around and started a door-to-door -door search for the killer. Suspicious-looking pedestrians were stopped at every street corner in the area. 10.30 p.m., the ambulance arrived and Lloyd Hopper's body was removed to the county morgue. Along with Sergeants Lopez and Mitchell from Homicide, Jack McCready, Frank, and I continued checking in the immediate vicinity of the killing. We found no one who'd admit they actually saw the shooting. Half a dozen people in the crowd told us that they'd heard shots and saw Hopper fall to the pavement. They'd also seen a man standing behind Hopper turn and run down the street right after the shooting. No one had followed him. The man was described as medium build, wearing a dark suit and a dark hat. That's all they could tell us. With a possible description of the suspect, more men and cars were brought into the search for Hopper's assailant. 11.25 p.m. Frank and I met Jack McCready back at the office. Hi, Jack. You got anything? Checked out every store in the neighborhood that was open. Not much. How about you? Pretty full. Lopez and Mitchell turned up a newsboy. He told him he saw a guy in a dark suit running down the street. Yeah. Thought he saw the guy come out of that bar out there. We heard that too, Jack. We talked to the bartender. He doesn't recall the man. Oh, I almost forgot. Mrs. Hopper's been calling in. Wants to know where her husband is. Oh, uh, yeah. I asked personnel to hold off notifying her. Thought maybe you fellas would want to tell her. You knew Hopper pretty well, didn't you? Yeah, long time. Family man? Three kids. Oh. If you fellas don't want to tell her, I'll call personnel back. They can do it. It's all right. We'll tell her. Frank and I got in the car and headed out for the home of the slain officer, Lloyd Hopper. The house was on Ralston Avenue, a few blocks from where Frank lived. We parked the car and went up to the front door. The lights were burning in the living room. What? I say it's a lousy job. And somebody's got to do it. Yeah. Well, I heard it. Somebody's coming. Hi, Joe. Frank. Hi, Betty. Hi, Betty. Sure glad you can make it. Everyone's here. They're in the den. Oh, come on. Meet you two. I'm still waiting for that wandering husband of mine. If he's not here by midnight, he's going to be in the doghouse for sure. Here, can I take your hats? No, thanks, Betty. We'd like to talk to you. Well, what's the matter? Can't you stay long? Not too long, no. Oh, that's too bad. Here, can I get you something? No, thanks. Nothing. Have either one of you seen Lloyd? That's what we wanted to talk to you about, Betty. What? Would you like to sit down? What is it, Joe? Tell me. Well, he had an accident. Where is he? I want to see him. How about an accident? Pretty bad. I want to go see him, Joe. He's hurt. I want to see him. Couldn't be that bad. 
खले प्लीज जाओ प्लीज ना दे family doctor and he told us he'd be over as quickly as possible. One of Betty Hopper's relatives at the party said she'd look after things until the doctor arrived. Frank and I left the house and drove back to the scene of the murder. The house to house check of the entire area was still going on. No trace of the killer. 1:30 a.m. Traffic began thinning out. The street crowds disappeared. 2 a.m. The search went on. A little before 2:30, a patrolman on foot located a taxi cab driver in the neighborhood who claimed that he'd seen a man answering the killer's description just after the shooting. Frank and I went down the street to talk to the cab driver. Glad I passed along for whatever it's worth, officers. Happened a minute or two before I picked up my last fare. What time was that? Do you remember? There's no remembering about it. I got the way room. 9:48 p.m. I was parked down the street, same old stand. Picked up a fare, took him down to North Main as a teller, and I came back here. Yeah, broke down. I've been waiting for the repair truck ever since. Well, just what was it that happened before you picked up that fare here at 9:48? Is that right? Yeah, 9:48. It was a minute or two before that. I was parked down the street. This guy comes running through the crowd. He was really running too. Yeah, go ahead. He was almost past me when all of a sudden he turns around and stops and looks at me. I figured he wanted a cab, so I opened the door for him. He said, "Never mind, or something like that," and tore off down the street. Maybe he was goofed up or something. I don't know. Can you remember what he looked like? Kind of like your build, I guess. Medium. Wore a hat, dark hat, dark suit. Did you get a look at his face? Yeah, it was about 28, 30, dark complexion. Anything else you remember about him? Nah, not for sure. Didn't look any different from a hundred other moochies that hang around this neighborhood. Nothing else you remember about this man that you think might help us, huh? Nah, you got it all, Sergeant. Just that he acted a little queer. That's all. Goofed up, probably. Did you see which way he went when he took off? Yeah, right down the street that way. Lost himself in the crowd. I couldn't be bothered. Uh huh. Now, how about when he came running down the street toward you? You happen to notice where he came from? Matter of fact, yeah. I was right after I heard those shots. Of course, I didn't know there were shots then. Yeah. It looked to me like it came out of the joint right near where the cop was shot. What joint is that? This one right here, the um, two twenty-eight club. It wasn't much, but it was the only lead we had to go on. Seven persons in the vicinity at the time of the shooting had volunteered the information that the killer had been a recent customer at the two twenty-eight club, the neighborhood tavern. The owner and bartender of the club, a Ralph Stevens, had been questioned twice that night by different officers, and he twice denied that there was any possibility that the killer could have been a patron at his bar. Stevens' denials didn't make any more sense than the killing itself. We made arrangements to have the cab driver we interviewed come to the city hall to check through our mug books for the suspect. By 10 a.m. the next morning, the body of the slain homicide officer Lloyd Hopper had been posted. Four bullets were taken from his back, two from the base of his skull. Sergeant Udy ran the slugs through ballistics, where they were identified as having been fired from a .45 caliber Colt automatic. 11:12 a.m. Frank and I re-questioned the bar owner, Ralph Stevens. Now look, how long does this thing have to go on? I told you everything I knew last night. We know that, Stevens. It doesn't seem to jive with what the other witnesses saw. Oh, well, maybe you better take it up with them then. I don't know anything about it. How come you're so sure the man we want wasn't in your place last night? It just wasn't. That's all. I know who I serve. I know who comes in. Pretty good crowd in here last night. You remember every one of them, do you? I told you I know my customers. I know who I serve. The guy you want wasn't one of them. That still doesn't answer. How can you be so sure? Now look, I'm not on trial here. You asked me what I know, and I told you. If you don't mind, I got work to do. We got some work to do ourselves. Now we'd appreciate it if you'd cooperate with us. All right. If you want to know the truth, you're not good for my business here. Cops never are coming around asking questions. Customers don't like it. It's no good for business. No good at all. Now look, an officer was killed last night right outside your front door. Half a dozen people say the guy who did it was in here drinking. I run this place. It's mine. I say the man wasn't in here. Still like to know how you're so sure. I'm getting a little tired of this. I don't have an office down at the city hall to lounge around in. I've got work to do. How about leaving, huh? Maybe it's about time you get this straight, Mister. This one's about a killing. It happens to be our job to check it out. Now, if you don't want to talk here, we can make it downtown. 
I hope you don't think you scare me. I've owned bars before. I've had it out with cops like you. You're not scaring me a bit. Nobody's trying to scare you. We want a few straight answers, that's all. You mind leaving? I got work to do. I told you that before. All right, suppose you get your coat. We'll talk downtown. Not before I call my lawyer. Go ahead and call him. Where's your coat? Oh, why do we have to have trouble? I haven't got any beefs with you. No trouble, Stevens. We have to get to the bottom of it, that's all. Like that, they cooperate. Maybe the guy was in here last night. Came in a couple of times, that's all. I didn't want it to get out. Bad for business, those things. Can't afford it. Keeps customers away. Then the man was in here last night, huh? I wasn't trying to cover for him. Hardly know him. I just didn't want it to get out. I got a right to protect my business. Who is the man? Harry Talmadge. He's a hophead. If he did it, it probably wasn't his fault. How do you mean that? He was hyped up last night. Used his heroin. He probably didn't mean to shoot. Where do we find him? I wouldn't know if this is right. An old address. What is it? Fairview Hotel. Try there. <laughs> We got in touch with Sergeants McCready and Lopez from Homicide. They drove downtown to check at the Fairview Hotel for the suspect. 11.58 a.m., Jack McCready called us back. Yeah, Jack. Mm-hmm. Now, that's right, the Fairview Hotel on South Grand. Yeah, huh? What do you have to say? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, well, that's the way it goes. Right. Okay, Jack. Yeah, no, no one check you later. Bye. Bye. When we checked out the hotel, we talked to the desk clerk. Tell me, Jeff. He was. Yeah. Checked out two months ago. No leads. <laughs> 1 p.m., New Year's Day. After we found that the suspect, Harry Talmage, had checked out of the Fairview Hotel months before, Frank and I went back to the office and ran his name through R&I. The information given us by Ralph Stevens, the owner of the 228 Club, was apparently correct. The record on Talmadge showed that he was a confirmed user of narcotics. He'd served two brief terms for illegal possession of narcotics and another short term in the county jail for petty theft. We got out a broadcast and an APB on Talmadge. We checked out all his known friends and relatives, the places he frequented, hotels and boarding houses that he'd stayed at. No leads. With the help of Lieutenant Bigham in narcotics detail, we finally found the trail most likely to lead us to the suspects, the peddlers who were suspected of supplying Talmadge with narcotics. They were to be kept under 24-hour watch. Three days passed. No results. Monday, January 4th. After Frank and I went to the funeral and burial services for the murdered officer, Lloyd Hopper, we checked back into the office. I don't know, Joe. I don't take much to funerals. Not a cop's funeral, anyway. And I don't blame you. His wife, Betty, seemed to look a little better, didn't she? Yeah, seemed to be darn up pretty good, considering. Frank, Joe. Hi, Jack. Hello, Jack. That young fellow you told me about, he phoned me, Frank. Is that right? Did you give me information? Yeah. He wanted to know all about taking the police department examination. Who's that? Oh, one of the neighborhood boys. Nice kid. Wants to get on the force. I told him to apply at room 5 City Hall any weekday. He could make out his application then. That it? Fine, Jack. Thanks. They got the recruiting campaign going now, huh? Yeah, I guess so, Joe. Taking applications from all over the country. I got it. Homicide Friday. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, oh, just a second. Yeah, go ahead. Uh-huh. Donaldson, huh? D-O-N-A-L-D-S-O-N? Yeah, uh-huh. I got it. Okay, fine. Yeah, thanks. There's big in narcotics. Might be something. What's that? We got a line on one of the mules who used to push heroin to Talmadge. A guy by the name of Donaldson. He's been sounded out. He's ready to talk to us. Is Donaldson close to Talmadge? Supposedly, yeah. You know where Talmadge is? Let's ask him. Frank and I left the office and drove to the address on South Alameda where Donaldson, a friend of the murder suspect, was supposed to be staying. It turned out to be a cheap hotel in the Skid Road district. It was next to one of the rescue missions down there. We checked with the desk clerk at the hotel, and he pointed out Donaldson. He was listening to the music of a small mission band coming from outside. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah? Your name Donaldson? Yeah. We're police officers. This is Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Surely. Isn't that nice, Sergeant? Music from the mission. Sure do like it. I even go over and listen to the sermons. Do me a lot of good, especially the drum. I understand you're not pushing junk anymore, Donaldson, that right? Call me Biggs. Name's really John, but everybody calls me Biggs. No, I hadn't been pushing junk, not for months, all through with it. When's the last time you saw Harry Talmadge? A couple of weeks ago. 
I'm not much of a Harry anymore. Like I say, I've been spending a lot of time at the mission, hearing the sermons. Changes the way a fellow does things, you know. The reason I moved in here close. Yeah. A man's got to turn good sometime during his life. I figure it's time I start living by the word. Hey, that's nice music, isn't it? Yeah. Do you have any idea where we might find Talmadge now? I might have a few ideas on it. I don't know. Say, I guess neither one of you fellas use snuff. No. No, thanks. Don't bother you, does it? I know the last boarding house Harry stayed at, if that'll help any. Place out on 12th Street. I can give you the address. Is he still there, do you know? Don't think he is, no. Matter of fact, I'm sure he's not. I wish Harry'd come around and see me. I'd like to get him interested in the mission. Get him listening to the sermons. Might help him. Did an awful lot for me. You say you saw Tommy about two weeks ago, huh? Well, not quite two weeks ago. It was the day after Christmas. Came down here and wanted some money. I couldn't give him any. That's when he told me he was moving. Going to move to some rooming house up around the city hall section up there. You mentioned any address? Not that I can recollect, no. Sure is nice music, isn't it? How about some of his other friends, Big? Think they might be able to help us? Or Duke might help you. Harry and Duke are still great friends. Duke sees him more than I do. Where do we find this Duke? Uh, you know the Penny Arcade down on South Main? Right down from the train depot there? Yeah. That's where Duke works. He's a janitor there. I've been trying to get Duke to come to some of the mission meetings, too. He sure could stand it, old Duke. Well, thanks very much, Biggs. Not at all, Sergeant. Always glad to help out. <laughs> Look at that now. All out of snuff. Say, uh, you couldn't see your way clear, could you? Yeah. Here you go, Biggs. Oh, that's sure Christian of you, officer. I'll handle this just like a personal loan. That's all right, Biggs. Don't say anything about us talking to you, will you? Not to anyone. No, sir, I won't. You can trust me. Say, when you see Harry, you give him a message, huh? Yeah, what's that? You tell him to come and see me. I want him to show up at the meetings, hear the sermons. Could change everything, Sergeant. Could give him a new life, a new soul. Think of that. A brand new soul for Harry. Yeah, he could use one. Three p.m. Monday, January fourth. We drove down to the Penny Arcade on South Main. Harry Talmage's friend Duke wasn't there. The manager of the place gave us his home address, and we left to check it out. Duke wasn't at his home either. We staked out the place for the rest of the afternoon, but he failed to show. At 8.30 that night, officers from Homicide came out to relieve us. Frank and I stopped for dinner, then we went back to the office. 10.05 p.m. You want to grab that, Joe? Got it. Homicide, Friday. Yeah. Oh, he did, huh? When? Uh-huh. Did he say anything? Yeah. All right, wait a minute. Okay, go ahead. One, seven. Two, seven. That's West. Right, I got it. Apartment three. Okay. Right. Okay, right away. And anything? Duke just came home. They talked to him. They get anything? Tell me his address. Yeah. Duke says he's there now. We got in the car and drove out to the West Hoover address. We were to meet Sergeants Jack McCready and Bill Mitchell. 1727 was an old two-story apartment house. Apartment number 23 was on the ground floor at the rear of the building. While McCready and Mitchell covered the rear exit, Frank and I went in the front way. your gun? Sure, it's mine, one of it. Why'd you kill him? Because I wanted to, that's all. He was a cop. Is that your only reason? I told you he was a cop. Shot him, that's all. What's the difference? Big one, mister. Why? Got my way, so I killed him. Just one cop less. What's the difference? Ask his family, they'll tell you. On March 
March 26th, the trial was held in Department 92, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and convicted of manslaughter, which is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period not to exceed ten years. Welcome back. Well, some really strong emotional elements just beneath the surface on this one. As it starts with them just talking about whether to go to this party their friend was throwing, and then we learn he died. And they do face that moment of truth as to whether they're going to go out and tell his widow. And that's something that's been pretty consistent throughout the series, that it's something that they hate to do to tell people uh, that their loved ones have died. And in this case, even harder. But they decide to go and do the right thing. And they did throw in this detail. I'd not caught it the first few times I'd listened. But it mentioned that he lived in the same area as Frank Smith, which indicates, particularly in that era, that they probably knew each other personally and it makes it all the more hard. And the scene where they finally manage to communicate it to the wife, it's devastating. Her life has changed just in a matter of moments. So I think in this very subtle way, it really does bring home the emotional impact of what happened. Other things that happened, I did find the scene with the bartender interesting just because for someone who uh, says he doesn't want any trouble with the police and doesn't want to antagonize the police, sure does antagonize the police a lot. The scene in front of the mission was primarily interesting because we got to hear a succession of all of the songs that Salvation Army or Rescue Mission bands are portrayed in playing in classic entertainment. You had Bringing in the Sheaves, followed by Rock of Ages, and then wrapping up with the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Now, while I'm not an expert on religious band music of the era, I think this probably has less to do with the fact that these three songs were played all the time by these organizations uh, than it does the fact that all three of these songs were well in the public domain, and therefore you didn't have to pay any rights holders. Well, that will do it for now. <laughs> 